today I'm super excited to have the writing duo of Julia Fierro and Chaley Wolfson Widger, uh, who write collectively as the writing duo Cassidy Lucas. They have an amazing new book. It's called The Last Party, and we're here to talk about it today. I think you guys are going to love this book. I know I did. And uh, and welcome to the show, Julia and Chaley. Thank you, Hank. Hank. <laughs> so, so we begin each show with the same question, and we've got so much fun stuff to talk about today, but we cannot get to that yet until we tackle this first question. And uh, we'll start with you, Julia. What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Huh, that is a great question. Um, I do feel that growing up, I wanted to be something more fun and and active and uh, filled with instant gratification, like a Broadway star um, or something, you know, just as one does. Yes. Yeah, so it wasn't until I actually went. I mean, I, I, I didn't even know that you could be a writer, you know, that it's something that you could do um, for a living, which, you know, and so it wasn't until I. Um, I went to graduate school that I kind of believed that you could do that. Um, but I had always loved stories. Um, I especially grew up loving um, mythology. And so I think looking back that I was always searching for stories. And um, so I think it was really part of me from when I was really young. But um, But it took me a while to sort of believe that I could do it, I guess. It took, you know, took me a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny that you you talk about, uh, you know, not knowing that that's a, a profession that you could actually do. There's a weird thing that happens when you're a kid, especially when you go to the library or the bookstore and you see these just shelf after shelf of books. And, and they're all stories that were told by someone. And uh, but it, it's like one day the realization hits you that there's a person behind this, like someone <laughs> actually did the work yeah. behind this. And then other people helped them, uh, you know, edit it, publish it, you know, make a cover for it, bind it. Like there's a whole string of people that are involved in this thing coming to the shelf. And and there, there's it's like a, a, a weird realization that happens like, oh, I could be one of those people that's that steps into the process somewhere. And that's a, that's an empowering thing for a, especially for a young person to realize. Yes, definitely. That was really beautifully said. Um, <laughs> I'm still you too can spend shocked. four years working on something with <laughs> unknown, <laughs> with an unknown payoff. But, exactly. No, you're right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it's still amazing. Like, Chaley and I will be texting each other, and I'm like, wait, are we really publishing our fourth novel? You know, second novel together. Right. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's just, it's almost impossible to believe, even though we went through every agonizing moment of all four of those books. But. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, your question is one that I have a rare, very specific memory to I answer love it. with. I, know. Um, I love it already. And I you know what she's going to say. I began my writing life as a poet um, and sort of maintained that ruse for 25 years or so before I transitioned into <laughs> writing fiction. But I was 10 years old or nine years old, I think, in fourth grade. And I grew up in central Florida where. Um, as you probably know, Hank, from, from living in Mississippi, um, there are epic thunderstorms in the afternoons in the summer. And Yes, and we've had um, those every Wednesday um, for a month now. It's just <laughs> horrendous, only on Wednesday. Uh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Don't, yeah it is what it is. Anyway. So that's, that's interesting. Um, anyway, I, it was this, this was later at night, but I, I was in bed, and there was a particularly dramatic operatic thunderstorm happening outside and um 
I just remembered kind of the experience of the storm churning up a lot of big feelings and um, sort of exhilaration and some fear. And um, I just had a gut level desire um, to write a poem. And so <laughs> grabbed my journal and I wrote a poem, The Night Opera. And um, that was, that was Great. like, it, um, it was, it was one of those, I don't really believe in epiphany, but it was one of those rare kind of wow. epiphanic moments where I realized that writing um, was incredibly gratifying and helped me make sense of my experience. Oh my gosh. Epiphanic oh, moment. Feeling. I think that's the only epiphanic moment I've had in my life. So great question to start with because yeah. <laughs> epiphanic moment is is gonna I'm I'm introducing that into my vernacular from here on. Yeah. Wow. I'm honored. <laughs> so so you guys uh write together. This is your second book, The Last Party is your second book that you've written together. But as you alluded to, Julia, um you you guys have written more uh, you've also written separately as well as together how did you how did you meet and i i understand that there um was a a sort of fortuitous meeting um in in the writing world that that got you guys together what 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 brought you together originally Jaylee or me or go ahead Jaylee. who who um, whomever sure. so has the inspiration I, I'll speak after you, your tiffany moment i will tell you um yes i found Julia on Craigslist. <laughs> uh, um, Julia had just launched or recently launched her writing school that she has, it's now coming up on his tw the 25, 25th year anniversary of the second. Wait, 20th, 20th, Chaley. We're not that Is old. it 20th? Oh, okay. 20th. 20th, sorry. <laughs> Trying to add half a decade there. We're actually both 60. Um, no, anyway. Um, <laughs> So she had recently launched her, her writing workshop and I had recently moved to New York from California and was sort of secretly writing short stories. And um, after having gone to graduate school for poetry and was looking for a workshop and I found Julia's listing on Craigslist and I'll never forget it. I, I called, I might've submitted an application. I can't exactly remember who called who, but I was in Ikea um, I think in New Jersey. And um, we spoke on the phone about me joining Julia's fiction workshop. Um, and I liked her right away on the phone and uh, showed up for the first class. And I think back then she was padding the numbers of her class with like her husband and her sister-in-law. Um, but it was a good group. And I really, um, I, I was, um, I left that first meeting um, feeling transformed. And like, I, I decided I wanted to commit to being a fiction writer. So Julia was my teacher. She was my workshop leader and uh, really important in my, my formative stages of writing fiction. And then we became best friends and co-authors over time. Well, it's very generous of Chile to call it a school at the time because <laughs> what it really was was me um feeling lonely and and also wanting a group of people a group of writers or people who wanted to be writers we, i didn't even care what level anyone was or how much experience they had and um i just really uh, needed to talk about writing with people and I also specifically wanted to talk about it with more with people outside the literary scene so to speak um you know just really talk about craft and I my first book had gone out with my agent to editors and didn't sell thank goodness I can say that now um and so I was feeling really crushed. And so I just, I think it was my mom who said, have a class in your kitchen or something, you know? And um, and I put it out on Craigslist and Chaley showed up and she was like, she was amazing, you know? And it was just, 
she she had everything already um and she just needed like she basically needed a writing friend to push her and say duh you can write fiction (laughs) (laughs) you know i will say i mean um I, i don't know if julia bypassed this biographical fact on purpose if she's just being modest but um but oh. Julia went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, obviously, like most prestigious writing program maybe in the world. And I think what, I mean, that was cool to me from a distance, but, you know, as Julia said, she really didn't care about what levels or sort of what accomplishments people were bringing to to sit around her kitchen table in her workshop. But that, I think that spirit of loving to read and loving to write and just geek out on craft is what drew me in and kept me there. And really the thing that I think has kept her school, we can definitely call it now going, but I think we share that value of just loving to read and write and deconstruct how an author makes a certain impact on a reader. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think also going back to the why why we write question, I think that, you know, both Chaley and I came together through a need. You know, we really needed. Chaley was new, newish to New York. I had just kind of gone through this big loss of not selling my book. And I was adjuncting it like four different universities, you know, in New York, driving around, like, I'm not a good driver. <laughs> and, um, oh, my God, it was so stressful. And I think that, you know, that SAC, it's called the Sack of Street Writers Workshop. And that came out of a need for that I had for community and for other people, you know, who were like, you know, engineers, lawyers, poets, you know, stay at home parents. Um, and I think it's similar to writing, you know, we do it because we need to. Um, and, and it is true, you know, what Shelly was saying, she said it so perfectly that we, we, we just enjoyed analyzing, you know, the crap out of <laughs> fiction. <laughs> like the I, crap out of the craft. I was serving coffee at like nine o'clock at night. You know, we were young. We were in our 20s. We had, you know, it was just, and we would just spend hours and hours trying to figure out how a writer did something that we wanted to emulate. And so when Shaley, after we published our second books under our own names, we were in, uh, we were in Williamsburg. We had just gone to this. Oh, it was like some kind of. It was a. It was a. Um, it was for Epiphany magazine. It was a. Uh, a fundraiser, and it was on the roof. Fancy like William Gale, I think, hotel. Mm-hmm. And of course, like you know, it's all like broke writers and stuff. It wasn't, but we were in a really fancy place. You know, we were like, yeah, we're like on top of the world. And we got it. And, and Chaley, Chaley said, oh, do you hear that? Oh, no. Sorry. I hear a little vibration. And Chaley, let's write a novel together. And I was like, what? And then I, I said, OK. You know, not really thinking it would. Talk to me when you haven't had three glasses of champagne. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that was it, you know, and I knew that we shared this writer's brain. I mean, it's really incredible the connection that we have with that with our writer's brain. You know, we can um Chaley can write a scene with dialogue and action and gesture, and then I can go in and add the interiority. You know, it's really um I mean, it's really, it's really unique, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine like a painter doing that, but that is kind of what, you know, we're doing. Like we, we each add layer after layer and take turns, um, to make like a complete painting, you know. Let me ask you this. Much longer answer than. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 that was, that was great. I mean, but. Um, 
but I, I have to ask this. Um, Chaley. Sorry, go ahead, Hank. Chaley comes from a background uh, of poetry and brings that certain uh, view uh, of the world, or, or sk and and, and skill set that like there there are certain tools in the in in a poet's toolbox um, that they have and that they utilize. Um, you, for the the writing that you do um, by yourself, Julia, where where do you um, see yourself fitting in the in the the spectrum of kind of what is your natural genre that you land in or your natural writing style? Like like it, aside from what what then becomes when you become Cassidy Lucas, um, where do you, where do you fit? Well, it's interesting. Wow, you you have really good questions. <laughs> These are great. This is really like at the heart of it. Um, <clears throat> well, Chaley, you know, we made sure that we um, we uh, we beat the poet out of her in fiction. <laughs> job. She's dead. Because while she's still obviously, I can't even pronounce the epiphany word, epiphanemic, whatever. <laughs> she still got the chops. Um, <clears throat> she is really a fiction writer. Well, I think Chaley is so adaptable. You know, she can write poetry. She could write a screenplay, I'm sure. I don't even know. I think she has. Um, she, you know, I am not as adaptable. You know, I feel like with, our, with my first two books, I guess they're more what you would call literary fiction or literary commercial fiction, you know, like literary fiction that's not going to hurt your brain. Um, yeah. And then for these two books under Cassidy Lucas, you know, we were striving to create a more what, you know, I guess you would call a commercial experience, like a a thriller and then yeah yeah this next one is a mystery thriller um the last party so but i feel like i just wrote the way that i always write you know um that for me the most for me the only thing that matters in writing and in life really is story you know i mean like i accost like strangers online at trader joe's and force them to tell me a story or something you know it's just <laughs> I get bored really easily and yeah. um and I see it in my kids too particularly in my son who has the same hyper brain act you know energy that I have yeah like if he's not in front of a screen he's like walking around the house like who wants to hear a story and I'm like oh no. <laughs> please you know and then you think to yourself oh I did this to this kid this is yeah. this is my fault <laughs> I mean, I had my copy of like Delaire's illustrated mythology book, like all, you know, messed up from carrying it in the woods as a kid, you know, and my brother and I would play like these mythological games. So I was just waiting to give it to my son. Um, and and he really influenced the ending of my second book, The Gypsy Moss Summer, because of that. So I do think for me, it comes from a more again back to the need like a pure need to tell stories um and to hear them and and shape them um because i did it was really shocking when i got into the i writers workshop i don't come from intellectuals i mean I, my parents my you know my mother was very smart my father's very smart but <laughs> you know I didn't really realize what I was walking into. Um, and everyone there was so educated and had wanted to go to the writer's workshop their entire lives. And again, I just wanted to be a Broadway star or something. But um, I do think that uh, it's all about story. And it's really amazing yeah. to have a friend that you care about so much and admire and feel safe with in that mental you know creative space to to shape a story with and yeah. that's what Chaley and I get to do so it's 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 remarkable that we can do that together and that 
somebody actually wanted to publish what we came up with. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's go back to that that moment when uh, when you guys you know said let's write a novel together. And um, Chaley, what what was that moment like for you? What was that? Yeah, I, one thing that I love to hear people talk about because. Because this is where some of the 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 pure magic of writing comes from is that, um, you know, we can study craft and we can pick apart the way a writer um, describes the scene, the setting and and the emotional, um, you know, charge that comes from it. And, and we can go through all that. But there there's still something magic that comes from um, the fact that at one moment a story does not exist in any form or fashion. And then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind or you start thinking of a setting and then you start casting that setting with imaginary people. And then, you know, something magic happens. It comes in and it becomes alive. And then as a writer, it's your job to, to excavate, you know, that story and to dig it out and to carefully pull it out and then hone it and polish it until it becomes, you know, a thing that sits on a shelf somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it, but, but it becomes something out of nothing. Um, so what was that first moment? Like when you guys first started, you know, thinking about doing this together and, you know, where all the synapses are firing and, you know, all of the creative possibilities or, you know, you know, that, that first moment of when you start thinking of a story and ideas are just flying around and all the excitement that comes with that. What was that moment of creation? Like when, when your writing partnership first came alive? Wow. That was just such a beautiful and lyrical, um, um, Inks the best. Yes, way. <laughs> yeah, description. No description of how um, you know, sort of the um, germination of this type of project. But um, I feel almost guilty, like stripping the romance out of it um, by telling you. <laughs> uh, no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I have a really short answer. Uh, so it started at the gym. Okay. Um, yep. It started at the gym. Um, I, um, a couple years ago went through a phase where I was quasi compulsive about attending high intensity interval training <laughs> workouts. And I forced Julia to start going to my gym with me here in Santa Monica. And we became kind of gym rats together. Uh, and it was both painful. Of us, both of us had just written or fairly recently had come off writing individual, um, pretty ambitious um, literary fiction leaning novels. And I think um, we had so much fun at the gym, not so much um, during the workout, but analyzing, observing <clears throat> the room, kind of that ecosystem and its particular cast of characters that are associated with fitness culture in Los Angeles. And it was so <laughs> much fun, essentially workshopping our experience at the gym together. <laughs> and so, so that's really where the idea took shape for me. And then when I, you know, it, it hit me. So then, so that was kind of the first piece. The other two pieces are that I, um, when I can't sleep at night, I um, read kind of compulsively, um, com like uh, like commercial-ish thrillers, and yeah. it's like my it's like my sleeping pill. I, I wake up, I can't read, I can't sleep, and then I read these books, and they lull lull me back to sleep. And I might read, you know, one to three a week. So that 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 was also kind of marinating in my mind. Um, Look, don't then, be ashamed to say it. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. No, no. I mean, I love, I love, I, I cherish my, my, just like my, my best alone time. But anyway, those two components. And then um, I, the third one is also really pragmatic. Um, like I said, Julie and I had been spending, you know, as novelists do years putting together, uh, you know, hard, lonely years, writing these, um, you know, passion driven novels. Um, and I just thought, well, if we combined our forces, took, um, you know, took our experience at the gym and, um, you know, and what we both know of how, um, 
of how really readable but smart thrillers work, if we could put all those pieces together, <clears throat> what would stop us from writing a book instead of in four years in a year or a year and a half? So it was really like circumstantial and practical and then definitely informed by this sort of magical readerly brain that we share. But then it all kind of came together on that night that Julia already described in Brooklyn. So yeah. that first book, Santa Monica, is is a little bit satire, um, a little bit thriller, um, and and kind of came out of that experience that you guys were sharing. Thank you for um, closing the loop on that, Hank. Yes, I don't know why I'm assuming that your <laughs> listeners have all read, uh, you know, our whole canon, but um, uh, yes, Santa Monica um, is largely our first novel together as Cassidy Lucas is largely situated at the gym. And while it's, you know, heavily fictionalized, it is based in, in that shared experience that I described yeah. of working out together. And I hadn't been in L.A. long, so I was, I mean, I'm even six years later living here, I'm still in shock, you know, because, you know, <laughs> I'm not in good shape. I don't have a sunny attitude. You have to <laughs> five a lot at the gym, which I just, you know, germs. I felt that way even before COVID. And so right. this was like, <clears throat> I was athletic as a young person. But this was the first time in like 20 years that I was sweating and it was so brutal. Sometimes I thought I was going to throw up during class and Chaley's like next to me, like running like a gazelle at like 120 miles per hour. And so it was such amazing material. I mean, I yes, just, yes, and, it was. It was. I, I really. I saw a point of view opportunity in Julia's take outside. on the gym. Yes, outside. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Julia, go ahead. So, but the way that we work on the actual books, I feel like it's it's similar to how we used to work in workshop where, you know, the for me, the best way I can, I guess, help a writer um, is to just talk through what is it that you want to do? with either the story or this novel. And so we met in this sort of grimy writer space in Santa Monica. And we just said, okay, you know, we know we want to set it in the gym with these various characters. Let's- There will be a murder. Yeah, and then we, the way in which we work, and I think this is, I think this is good advice for anybody who wants to write with somebody else is we pick point of view. So we each had two characters that we initially assigned each other. And that way, the point of view of those characters would be consistent. Um, and then by the, so for the last party, oh my gosh, I can't even remember. <laughs> for the last party, we also divvied up the points of view and then we said, OK, you know, here's the general sort of arc of the story. Like we may not have, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen at the end, right in the beginning. And I do have to say that working on story um, or plot like that with somebody else, you know, I, I feel like one of the biggest things that I came out of this partnership with is that I always question my ability to craft a good story, maybe because I want it to be just perfect, you know, epically yeah. transporting. And I think I'm actually good at it, you know, <laughs> which of course makes sense now. But it was really amazing to, um, I feel like working with somebody else, kind of like couples therapy, mm -hmm. it shows you what you, <clears throat> it shows you your strengths and weaknesses, you know, like definitely, obviously I talk too much. I write too much. I'm too wordy. Chaley is there to like cut like 50,000 of my words or something <laughs> crazy. <laughs> so, um, that's, you know, that was something that I was like, Hey, if I had Chaley to help me with my first two books, which she did, you know, some, um, so I do think that, uh, 
it was really fun talking about the characters. I mean, texting each other because it is normally such a lonely experience. You create these people, this world, you know, this drama. And then <clears throat> when I'm writing a book, I don't talk about it really with anybody until it's done, usually by myself. Because uh, I'm that fragile, even though I run a writer's workshop. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, even after the Santa Monica was published or after we handed in the last party, we could still text each other or talk about like, hey, what, you know, what do you think this character is doing? Because there is really like a mourning period for me after I turn in the final draft of a book and I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess that's it. We'll never see each other again, fictional <laughs> characters. You know, I don't re read my books after they're I'm published. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, if we if we want to take this romantic view of writing and the creative process that that we are, um, you know, little gods in some, you know, strange, uh, you know, self-created universe um, that there there should kind of be a mourning process that yeah. this thing that you've created is now coming to an end and and maybe that's one reason why people you know write long running series because they just don't want to let go of those characters oh gosh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i have a I, I have problems with goodbyes like this is the, probably one of the oddest things about me but i don't watch i often don't watch the last episode in a series like a tv series that i've been watching for like years i still haven't seen the last episode of game of thrones you know, my my oldest daughter is that way. She'll she'll call us and she'll she'll be like, Mom and Dad, you'll have to watch this show. You know, she and her husband were were watching it. And then, you know, my wife and I will binge it over a weekend and then, you know, we'll be like, Hey Lauren, wasn't this amazing? And and she'll like, Oh, I didn't finish it because I was enjoying it too much. I didn't want it to end. Oh my gosh, she is like <laughs> she's my oh, kindred person. spirits. Yeah, it's so ah. funny. It's so funny. But let, let me ask you this. Um, Chaley, you write one thing, um, Julia writes another thing. When you come together as Cassidy Lucas, you, you have this, this other kind of voice, um, and, and you have, uh, certain, um, th there's a tendency to write certain types of stories. Do you feel like that? that Cassidy Lucas is this third entity in this relationship that you have with Julia Do, does does the act of writing with Julia create this this other writing entity oh that's such a deep question and a great one <laughs> yes yes i think so for sure i mean i think together we've discovered that we have between us, sort of a writing superhero, <laughs> like Julia. Well, like Julia alluded, it's and, true. And, and she can't. Well, she can't exist. She can't exist in us individually. Um, and you know, I think um, Julia kind of alluded to this earlier, but where this third person has really taken shape is through our process even though we do divvy up points of view and tend to take two characters each that we have ownership for, where Cassidy comes in is that after we have a somewhat skeletal draft um, in which we've each focused on our, let's say our Julia's characters and Chaley's characters, then we switch. And Julia goes through and adds, as she mentioned, the interiority, the thoughts, the expositions, um, the real driving emotion, right, behind the external scene. And then I will go in, and Julia's often written, you know, these amazing internal passages, and I will give them more of an external framework and situate them in dramatized scene. So that's this, this, this 
third person that you are asking about, that's where she comes in is that she's able to encompass the balance the internal and the external in this balanced way that I certainly don't maintain individually. So anyway, that's, that's, that's been the magic of the process. And that's how Cassidy is different from Chaley, the novelist and Julia, the novelist. Yeah. How about you, Julia? How do you, how do you feel about the existence of Cassidy? Well, <clears throat> this might be because I'm the more disorganized intellectually person in this combo, but <laughs> for me, for me, Cassidy Lucas probably doesn't really exist. It's it's Chaley and I. I think that's also because I'm not as maybe I'm not. A, I don't, when I write, I write the way I have to write. You know, it's not um. I don't feel that I have a ton of control over it in terms of changing the tone dramatically. I mean, like, you know, we set, we sold two books as more commercial fiction, you know, and I still wrote the same way I feel like I always write. But then again, Shaley was there to cut all my sort of, I guess, the like copious internal stuff like too much character thought that would make the book a, sl a slower read and make it more literary fiction give it literary like, pacing yeah I mean, great stuff but a different different reader so i think for me yeah. it's a little probably more challenging um to even think that i'm i mean it was interesting you know I'm always going to write the way that I write because writing is so hard that I have to lose myself in it. I mean, that's that's the that's the pleasure of writing for me is only yeah. in that in that escape, you know. Um, and then I also really do love editing, but that's a whole other, you know. We're yeah. talking about actual writing, um, so. I don't know. The Cassidy Lucas is, you know, it's interesting. I, I really, I, I wasn't sure about the whole pen name, you know, um, but I do think it was, it was necessary and it was smart. Um, but I do feel like there is still that purity of Chaley and I writing together as ourselves, yeah. bringing, you know, bringing our individual strengths, um, so I still do kind of feel like it's really just us. And it's funny when, you know, we have to talk about ourselves as Cassidy. So, you know, I'm just like, who is that lady? <laughs> who is this Cassidy lady? But, um, and it was hard to come up with a pen name. I'll tell you that, you know, <laughs> I do think that writing closer, you know, writing and closer to genre has been really um, freeing for Chaley and I. I mean, I went to the I writers workshop having written like a couple of short stories. So when I got there, I was just like, OK, this is how a writer is. You have to be super literary and don't talk about emotion and don't have too much drama. And then I left and I was like, wait a second, that's all the stuff that I love. Right. So I'm going to write genre benders for the rest of my life. Like I'm never I don't know. I shouldn't say never. But <laughs> I haven't read like pure literary fiction and unless I'm blurbing a student's book. Um, you know, I listen to like horror. Um, I'm really into sci-fi right now. And, and all of it is well written in that it has a literary style that challenges me, you know, my brain. Yeah. Um, but you know, the next couple of books I want to work on, um, the one I'm, I, I, I started is, it's futuristic, um, you know, a sci so I guess, it, it, you know, you would call it, it's like, there's a medical sci-fi component. Sure. And I want to write like historical fiction with a little bit of horror, a la Pan's Labyrinth. So I'm like, just running into the genre field i hope i love it um, 
but again, we'll always write the way that we write, you know, whatever. So it's always going to be psychological. Um, but I do feel like Chaley and I, part of the reason to write together and to try to publish in a different genre was to was a supportive, you know, decision. Because um, it was a little scary, you know, being like, OK, we're going to we're going to really make the plot wild, you know, especially for this last book. The plot is really, you know, there is a mystery element. So that was exciting. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if Santa Monica was a way for the two of you to sort of process your uh your new lot in life, your new surroundings, um, new passions, and to to kind of uh, flip the script a little bit and and make fun of almost um, some things you were seeing and people you were observing and and to to just kind of have fun with what you were experiencing in your own life is 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 definitely how I kind of in, interpret um, what that book might be for you. The last party, um, I, I would love to know what where this came from because um, I recently turned fifty, and and I understand the yeah that the, it's an interesting place in life, you know, and and so from that vantage point, we enter the world of the last party. Where where did the story come from? Well, Chelly. <laughs> Um, I really thought of it quite quickly. <laughs> so really, I mean, I think we'll just we'll just answer honestly. Um, Please do. We, <laughs> you know, we um, Santa Monica had gone out on submission, and we had some um, rumbles of interest from from various editors and. Our agent suggested that before we attended these editorial calls that we had an idea for a second book in our back pocket um, because that's sort of the way the way the way it can work um, with working in this sort of genre if you want to call it so we weren't sure if we were going to need it, but um, we knew one publisher well Harper who we, we are published with um, would be interested um in a series or in a second book so i think over the course of one afternoon in that grimy writer space we just met and brainstormed it was different grimy writer space it yeah it was a, yeah we've been yeah. to every every everyone in los angeles <laughs> um anyway i yeah i mean i think um we knew that we wanted um, or I think Julia has always been a fan of the, the tight timeline framework. Um, so we knew that we'd like to give ourselves that structure of a weekend or, you know, a, what's like a three day getaway. Um, and then um, we um, were uh, you know, thinking of books we had, and we, we knew they wanted to do kind of a, a locked room, you know, um, um, a getaway structure. Yeah. Um, but that we wanted to kind of also that, that's like a, a, a convention, right, of a, of a lot of, of thrillers, right? Um, you know, there's one that's coming out on HBO or something right now where it's like 20 years after the college graduation at the yeah. reunion, you know, it's a, it's a familiar setup. So yeah. we're fans of that familiar setup. It's a very handy device to work within, but we knew that we also wanted to give it a big twist to kind of flip that convention on its head. So we came up with those components in this brainstorming meeting. And then, you know, we thought setting, we knew we wanted to have another SoCal, you know, a very specific location. Um, and we thought of Topanga because it's so, um, it's so distinctive in its quirkiness and in its beauty and isolated you know, also isolated a little bit menacing. So all these pieces kind of came together in this brainstorming afternoon. Um, we went to the call. Um, we talked about Santa Monica. We pitched we pitched this yet to be written book, which at the time I think we were calling the Canyon. Um, and it just all came together very quickly. Um, but we really are fans of this convention 
of the locked room uh, friends with uh, kind of old buried wounds. And then we knew we wanted to flip it. Yeah. Um, so that 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 was really the genesis. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned those conventions because I, I have to ask this um, because there's been a lot of discussion um, be between some people in in, uh, in in my writing community lately about um, tropes that define a genre, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the locked room and, uh, the, you know, things like that, that, you know, we, we've all read a million books that 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 base around these these tropes. Um, right. But what keeps a trope from becoming cliche? Yeah. Well, I think the setting, <clears throat> I think for me, you know, the thing, it was funny because when we met, you know, this was pre-pandemic, I need to point out with an underline. <laughs> you know, we were like, and I remember thinking, right after we sold this basically like five sentence summary that I was like, whoa, that was ambitious, Julia. You like, you didn't hold back. You were like, let's do this crazy mystery, super complicated plot. Um, and for me, the setting was definitely something that was gonna automatically make it some you know unique in in some ways um topanga canyon i mean you know we're talking this is where the manson murders you know the, took place um it's such an unusual place you know it's very hard you know it's challenging to drive up into the canyon and drive back down so like people really do get you know, the people that we know that live there and we have some very close friends, um, they don't really leave the canyon that much. You know, it's it's a trek. And, and you know, like the sort of gym, you know, genre of Southern California, you know, there are some stereotypes of Topanga Canyon that are just absolutely true, you know? <laughs> Every time I go there, someone's like talking to me about crystals and, yeah. and the healing energy of, you know, there's, and so, but it's also like so many other parts of Los Angeles, um, changing, becoming wealthier, you know, we have the threat of the fires up there. It's just a very dramatic. Yeah. It was a very big up there. setting. Yeah. Um, but I and then also. Oh, oh go ahead. Well, Go ahead, Julie. Oh, no, no. I was just going just back to kind of, you know, how how do you, um, so, you know, ensure that a trope isn't going to veer into stereotype. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's of course, psychological nuance. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think it, it's very hard to write a, purely original story within these conventions of genre and yet I compulsively read them week after week after week and again and again um it sort of doesn't matter if the story yeah. is familiar right as long as the characters are complex and unique yeah. and distinctive and like it's like you know it's like craft 101 but it still applies anyway yes. go ahead, Julia. I was just gonna say the same similar thing that I just don't even care. I mean, you know, we're we're about to publish our fourth novel, so I feel like, hey, we're like big kids now a little bit, you know? <laughs> and after all, I mean, the way that I actually learned how to write was not at the Iowa Writers Workshop. It was, it was in my kitchen on Sackett Street with all these writers, and I taught a lot of novel writing workshops. And I quickly learned that it's not the what that matters, the what happens, it's the how. Yep. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't even really worry about it now because I know that I spend so much time in my characters' heads, like Chaley mentioned, the psychological nuance that, you know, it's the characters that are gonna make it unique. You know, what do they, what do they need? What do they want? What do they fear? Um, 
it's funny because my kids in school, I have one, my son's in high school, my daughter's in middle school. Both their parents are writers, you know, it's so annoying. Like, you know, <laughs> when they fight, they talk about not publishing each other because they make comic books. You know, it's like we've infected them with our literary nonsense. Oh, yeah. And um, sometimes they'll come home and they'll be talking about a book or a manga, Japanese comic or a TV show. And they'd be like, yeah, but I feel like they stole this from blah, blah, blah and mythology. And like my son's into Dungeons and Dragons, which is like just the theory of every great idea ever, <laughs> you know. And yeah. I'm always telling them, you know, exactly this. It's not the what. It's the it's the how, you know, the story unfolds and it's um, it can be unique. You know, I think uh, I don't know. I think people worry about that too much and they just have to know that at a certain point in the crafting of a story that's based on these so-called tropes, you're going to go in and, and, and if it's not unique then you'll you'll have to find a way to make it unique, you know. But I, I, mean, think, I think also learn know. from from writing those stories. Right. I mean, we had we we faced this late late in the game with the last party, Hank, in that we we had finally dialed in the storyline and you know, we had this um kind of very timely vaccine related mm -hmm. subplot and we were we were feeling pretty good about the plot mechanics of the book and most of the characters but we realized but the book it, the book wasn't done it wasn't right um and really the problem was you know to put it in very technical literary terms we didn't know what don's deal was yeah the, you know the protagonist we really just yeah. like hadn't figured out her inner workings and her motives and her needs and it's really those things as julia was saying that make a reader forget that they're reading something that is um that's very familiar just from a pure story perspective but mm -hmm. if the psychology is nuanced interesting dark demented enough you sort of forget that you're in a world that you may have experienced before plot wise Yes, demented. I like it. I love it. <laughs> <clears throat> the last party, uh, when you're hearing this episode, is going to be available everywhere, and we'll have links to it in the show notes where you can grab it in Kindle edition or in paperback or the uh, the Audible audiobook production. Have you guys heard any of the 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 pre um, the pre release? Uh, have you have you heard any of the audiobook yet? Is what I'm trying to say. Um, no, but I listen almost, you know, purely audio. I only read on audio now, which is a whole other topic, you know. Um, but we did, you know, it's very exciting when your audiobook is being made. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you get to kind of weigh in on the narrators. So, um, we do so we get listen that. to the demos. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me feel really like. It's exciting. Um, it I really exciting. love listening to books while I garden or, you know, sometimes I try and do actual email response work while I'm listening to my true crime <laughs> podcast and it hurts my brain, but keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can grab it in audiobook or uh, or Kindle or paperback, or go visit your local bookstore, and uh, you know let's let's help keep local bookstores alive, yeah. as well. Um, the last party is a book that I promise will keep you on your toes the whole time, uh, and it's a familiar story that takes you in unfamiliar places. Uh, you're gonna love it the same way I did. I know it. Um, Julia and Chaley, um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I feel like we could have just talked all afternoon oh, long. So enjoyable. Thank you so much, Hank. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you guys do, where can they find you online? 
JuliaFierro.com and, and all social on media. Com. Yeah, and we also have a Cassidy Lucas website. Yes, that will take um, you to all of our individual places as well. We have many social media, <laughs> um, and I am in charge of all of them, and it's hard yes. to update all of them. I'm like, wait, Cassidy Lucas homepage, Facebook page, you know, but um, you we know, are easily so. accessible online. Thank yes. you, Julia's F- social Great. media effort. Just Google content. us, baby. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We will link up all those places in the show notes to make it easy for folks to find you. Uh, Julia you. and Chaley, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Thanks, Hank. Thank you so much, Hank. It was such a pleasure.